This is Matthew Cratter's Bitcoin University. Today I want to talk about fixing Bitcoin mining centralization, both what the problem is and what the solution is in terms of datum. But first I want to do a bit of, of a review, bring everyone up to speed, how Bitcoin mining works. Well, we first have the Bitcoin blockchain. This is of course a series of blocks strung together and each block contains thousands of Bitcoin transactions where BTC is being sent from one Bitcoin address to another Bitcoin address. The Bitcoin blockchain contains the history of all Bitcoin transactions since January 3rd, 2009, as well as keeping track of how many spendable BTC are currently sitting at a given Bitcoin address. This is what's called the UTXO set. If you want to take a look at what the Bitcoin blockchain looks like, mempool.space is a great way to do it. You have blocks on the right side here that have already been mined. They go all the way back to the Genesis block, block number zero. Then you can scroll down here. You can see what's inside the block. You can see all of the Bitcoin transactions and how much people paid in Bitcoin transaction fees. So how do you mine a new block and add it to the Bitcoin blockchain? Well, the first step is you run a Bitcoin node that communicates with other nodes on the Bitcoin network, and your node then collects unconfirmed transactions from other nodes that have not yet been included in a block and includes them in a waiting room called the mempool that sits on your node. Every node has its own mempool. There is no one giant the mempool. Every node has its own mempool. As a miner, you peer into this waiting room on your node, and then you pick out transactions that you would like to try to include in the next block that you want to mine. Most of the time you're going, to, you're going to want to include the transactions that are paying the highest transaction fees, but if these transactions include garbage like scammy inscriptions, you may have a good reason not to include them. So what do you do as a Bitcoin miner? You collect a few thousand unconfirmed transactions, you package them up in a template, and you include a few other required pieces of data like the Bitcoin address that you would like to receive your reward to be paid to, the hash of the previous block in the blockchain. This is how the blocks get linked in a certain order. A number also that you can keep changing called the nonce, and you're going to keep changing the nonce as you're hashing this block template. Now, this is a very important part of the, of the process of Bitcoin mining that we're going to return to later. This process is called block template construction, and it gives whoever is doing it a lot of power over which transactions to include in a block and which to exclude. That means that miners could possibly choose to censor, i.e. not include transactions that their government overlords or regulators don't like, or just that the miner itself decides not to include. And this is why we want the process of Bitcoin mining to be as decentralized as possible. So once you have the block template all set up, you use a specialized machine called an ASIC, a Bitcoin mining rig, to repeatedly hash the proposed block in order to produce an output, in order to win the next block, the output of the hash function needs to be below a certain target number that's periodically adjusted by the protocol itself every 2106 blocks, 2000 and uh, I'm sorry, 2016 blocks. This adjustment kicks in and it's adjusted by the protocol to make it easier or more difficult to mine a block in order to keep blocks coming in every 10 minutes on average. This is what's called the difficulty adjustment. So this is what you're hashing. You're trying to guess a number that is below the target. And if you're first to find an output of this hash function, I'm going to show you that in a moment. If you're the first to find an output of this hash function that is below the target, you then win the current block subsidy of 3.125 Bitcoin. Again, this gets halved every four years, but we're currently at 3.125 Bitcoin. Before the 2024 halving, we were at 6.25 Bitcoin. But you get this current block subsidy plus all the transaction fees for transactions that have been included in that block. And that's why you're incentivized to include higher paying transaction uh, transactions paying a higher transaction fee in your blocks because you get to collect that revenue. Then once you have found a block or won a block, you must then broadcast this winning block to all the other nodes on the network, and they will then validate the block to make sure that you're following all the Bitcoin rules. There are no double spending transactions. Everything is following the consensus rules. If a node finds that your block is valid, then it will add it to the tip of its own blockchain. This is very important. There's no centralized, platonic, perfect copy of the Bitcoin blockchain. Instead, there are thousands of Bitcoin nodes all around the world, each building their own version of the Bitcoin blockchain. And then they converge over time, rapid, ra rather quickly actually, they converge to one version of the blockchain through this decentralized process called Nakamoto consensus that includes this proof of work, this hashing, as well as nodes validating everything and adding 
the blocks to their version of the block blockchain. If you're finding this video helpful so far, I just ask you to help to support the channel. Hit the subscribe button. That really does help to increase this channel's reach. Leave a like, leave a comment, question, suggestion for a future video. Share this video with a friend or family member as well. Now, before moving on, let's define some important terms that people always get confused. And I've been using these in a rather loose manner as well so far in this video. We have mining rigs, we have ASICs, which are these very specialized computers that can only do one thing, do SHA-256 hashes. And so another name for them, perhaps a more accurate name would just be hashers. These are machines that hash the block template again and again and again. So you have Bitcoin mining rigs, which are the machines, you have Bitcoin mining farms, and you have Bitcoin mining pools. And people also often confuse these. So here's what an ASIC looks like. This is a Bitcoin mining rig. And the only thing it can do is do SHA-256 hashes. Uh, this is uh, made by Bitmain, which is the main maker of these. And uh, this is a, a modern version of the S21 Pro. So that's a Bitcoin mining rig or an ASIC, or we could call it a hasher. This is the SHA-256 hash. You put an input right here in the data. You may have a nonce like this. I'm just using one, two, three, four, five. And then by, ha by clicking this button, you hash it. You basically put it through this hash function and you get an output. And so this is what the Bitcoin mining rigs, what the ASICs, what the hashers are doing. They're running this process again and again, and they keep changing the nonce and maybe changing a few things in the block to try to get something that to come out that is below the uh, the target. And so here I just changed the nonce a little bit, I'll hash again, and you can see that the output is completely different even though I just changed one number of the input. So this is what hashers do. They use electricity to run this mathematical hash function again and again and again. This is what a Bitcoin mining farm looks like, just a collection of ASICs, of mining rigs, of hashers in a single location. Now, in practice, most Bitcoin mining rigs choose to work for what's called a Bitcoin mining pool. This is not a pool here. This is a farm of ASICs. In practice, most Bitcoin mining rigs choose to work for a Bitcoin mining pool. And this is because one mining rig might take 10 years to find a block. It's become more and more difficult to find a block as the difficulty has moved up. In the meantime, while you're waiting to find a block, while you're waiting 5, 10, 15, 20 years to find a block, you have all those years of electricity bills to pay while you're waiting and your ASIC is depreciating as well. And you probably need to buy a new one after five or six years. Now, by hashing together with other people, in a mining pool, you can find blocks more frequently and then split the rewards based on how much work each machine is doing. So while a Bitcoin mining farm is a physical location, a Bitcoin mining pool is basically just a location on the internet. It can just be an IP address. So for example, I could be sitting in Colorado directing my ASICs hash to a mining pool in China or in California or in Europe or Australia or really anywhere else in the world. And if I don't like how this Chinese mining pool or whatever pool I'm mining with is behaving, maybe it's starting to censor Bitcoin transactions or it's trying to attack the protocol in other ways. If I don't like how this mining pool is behaving, I can point my hash to another pool very easily. I don't even need to move my ASIC. I just redirect it where it's being pointed to over the internet. So that's how the game theory works, at least in theory. If mining pools behave badly, ASICs will defect and point their hash to a different pool. And this is supposed to keep mining pools honest. At least that's how it's supposed to work in theory. But in practice, we have a real problem when it comes to Bitcoin mining centralization. And we've talked about this a couple times this year. Bitcoin mining is currently dominated by what are essentially just two large mining pools. We have an American pool called Foundry, which is a KYC pool where you have to give them your personal information. And then we have a Chinese pool. We can see the breakdown here of the hash of all the Bitcoin mining pools. We have Foundry, which is the big US one. And then we have Ant Pool via BTC, F2 Pool. These are all Chinese mining pools, as are some of these little ones on the left. But we can see between Foundry and these Chinese pools, that's probably uh, looks like about 75% of the hash. But it gets even worse. As it turns out, most Chinese mining pools are really just one giant mining pool using the same custodian and being controlled by Bitmain, who happens, as we saw, to make all the ASICs on the mining rigs as well. And it's really Bitmain and Antpool who are doing the block template construction. So even though you have all these different mining pools, uh, they're working together and they're hashing the same block 
template. And this is why this article says ant pool and bitmain acting as a pool of pools. We can see Mononod here saying a single custodian now controls the Coinbase addresses. This is where those Bitcoin mining rewards go. The Coinbase addresses of at least nine pools representing 47% of total hash rate as demonstrated by this cons consolidation of mining reward outputs from ant pool, F2 pool, Binance pool, Brains, uh, BTC.com, SEC pool, and pooling. So these all together are functioning as one giant Chinese pool. So here's the crux of the issue. While mining rigs, while ASICs, while hashers are portable and can be redirected to a different pool at any time, there are just a few groups in the world that are constructing the block templates. Remember, we talked about that, where you, bund you bundle up all the transactions, you create the header, the hash of the previous block, etc., and that's what you choose to hash. There are just a few groups in the world that are constructing the block templates that these mining rigs use as an input to their hash function. And so whoever controls these block templates gets to control which transactions get included in a block and can thus censor transactions if forced to do so by their government. So this is a huge potential problem for Bitcoin. At this point, it's just a theoretical problem. You would need some sort of collusion between the American, between Foundry, the US mining pool, and Ant pool and the Chinese proxies. But this is still a potential problem for Bitcoin. The big mining pool owners get to construct the block templates and basically ant pool and foundry everyone else with their bitcoin mining rigs is forced to hash what they're told to hash and you could go mine for one of these smaller pools but you may not have as much of an impact and they may be using the same block to block template as well so again the big mining pool owners get to construct the block templates everyone else with their bitcoin mining rigs is forced to hash what they're told to hash of course as we said hashers can always move to a new pool but foundry is us regulated and kyc so for example if you don't want to be part of the us regulatory net you're not going to want to be part of foundry and especially if you don't want to give up your personal information and then over in China, ant pool and related pools are presumably controlled by the CCP, like everything else over there. We haven't seen real censorship of Bitcoin transactions yet, but it could certainly happen if the US and the CCP ever decide to get together and attack the Bitcoin network. I like this uh, tweet from Jamie. If you think you're a miner, but don't create your own templates, your own block templates, think again, you're not really part of the Bitcoin network. You're just a mercenary hasher. I think that's a great way of putting it. Hashers of the world unite. This is where ocean mining and the new protocol Datum come in, allowing individual Bitcoin miners, hashers, mining rigs for the first time to easily construct their own block templates using their own node, rather than having to just hash whatever their mining pool tells them to hash. Datum stands for Decentralized Alternative Templates for Universal Mining. Similar to Stratum V2, Datum is designed to decentralize block construction by empowering miners to create their own block templates via their own Bitcoin node. Users can mine on pools that offer Datum support like ocean mining or solo mine without needing a third party to set up a server for them. And so now you can hash with the newest and most exciting Bitcoin mining pool. This is where I'm pointing my ASIC to. This is ocean mining. And we can see that their hash rate has really moved up over time. They've only been around for uh, not even not even a year and we can see the number of blocks that they found in October was tremendous and the hash rate has been moving up as well and they are now mining blocks whose templates have been picked by individual miners this was the first datum block it was block height 863471 first datum block this is huge for the decentralization protection of the network and going forward if you look at mempool.space you will see occasional datum blocks like this one called just for steve so you can also decide the name of what gets put here basically and this is an example of a datum block where no one really knows who just for steve is but he got to do his own block template construction so again the real problem that we've encountered here with bitcoin mining centralization is just a few people in the world having the power to, to construct block templates and so i'm very excited to see datum i haven't really used datum yet but i'm excited to see this as a possibility and it looks like it really is helping oceans hash as more and more people move over to the ocean mining pool if you enjoyed this video be sure to hit the subscribe and like buttons hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when i publish my next video and let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below thanks all for watching and I'll see you in the next video.